Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this Saturday afternoon for making kin in the urban jungle. Uh, and thank you for your patience as we sorted out a, a number of technical difficulties um, earlier, but we're very glad that we are now live with you. And uh, this virtual talk is a collaboration between Books and Beer, Ethos Books, and Climate Conversations. The link to our live note-taking document will be posted in the comments, so feel free to um, access that, and we will also be taking questions later via Slido, which we'll, we will also include in the comments. So we're so excited to welcome Anne Ang and Constance Singham with us here today, who are contributing authors in their, our Echo Feminist Anthology, Making Kin. We are also very glad to have Tok Sing Ying, who is the co-founder of Climate Conversations to moderate this talk. Now, without further ado, let me introduce the speakers for today. Anne Ang is a literature educator and published writer best known as the author of Bang My Car. She is co-editor of the literary anthologies, Poetry Moves and Food Republic, and also the coordinating editor of Prata, a new peer reviewed journal of creative theory and practice in Southeast Asia a keen birder, and also researches contemporary Anglophone writing from Southeast Asia and South Asia. Constance Singham is a writer and civil society activist. Constance has led women's organizations, co-founded civil society groups, been a columnist in national publications, and contributed and co-edited several books. Her works include A History of the TWC, Building Social Space in Singapore, Representing Singapore Women, and the Art of Advocacy in Singapore. Her memoir, Where I Was, was published in 2013, and her second memoir, Never Leave Town Without Chili Sauce, in 2016. Her children's books, The Birds in the Bamboo Tree, and Toby the Cocky Rooster, were published in 2021, and her third book, the Adventures of Ting Ting the Otter is a work in progress. Toxing Ying works as an ESG and sustainability consultant on issues like green banking, energy transition, and real estate in Asia. In 2017, she was a fellow at the Climate Strategies Accelerator run by Picard Foundation, Oak Foundation, and Good Energies Fund. She has worked on philanthropic strategies to mitigate climate change in China and the US since 2014. Singing on to you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy to have all of you join us this afternoon. Uh, as within introduced, my name is Singing. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Climate Conversations. At Karma Conversations, we create spaces for people to kind of discuss and understand how climate changes affect us here today in Singapore. And starting with the pandemic last year, actually, Climate Conversations started thinking and exploring about how art and literature can help us understand and see nature around us, especially at a time when we're all locked down and we're all cooped up in our homes, right? So we're trying to find different ways to help people engage with nature. So today I feel very honored um, that given that small little dabble into literature, uh, we've been invited by Ethos Books and Books and Beer to moderate this discussion about how we here in Singapore, um, even though we are very urbanized, how can we actually make kin with nature? And through that, um, maybe make kin amongst ourselves in different communities. So the way we see it um, between the self and the nation is these layers of communities that we build together around us. Um, and this is the fabric that really holds us together uh, and help us help each other in times of need. Right? So the question really is that is nature integral in helping us form these communities and whether or not we can, through this mutual love, for nature, find a shared purpose, find shared unity in these spaces that we've created. So today I have with me um, the two authors who contributed very heartfelt and very beautiful personal essays in this new book, Making Kin. And when I was reading their personal essays, um, they gave me much 
food for thought for these questions uh, today. And so I'm very happy to have them here, explore some of the themes um, around nature, community building, and a discovery of self and how we connect with each other. Um, and also take the opportunity to share some of the beautiful passages in their essays. So um, welcome, Anne. Um, welcome, Connie. As a start, how about tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, why you said yes to contributing to this collection of essays, and whether or not through the process of reflection in your writing, something crystallized for you about how you relate to nature. Um, maybe I start with Connie. <laughs> Well, I, I wasn't going to accept. At first, I was reluctant because uh, my knowledge of nature is my own personal experience. And um, it's not uh, studied or expert in, um, in a, about our environment like Anne is, I think. Yeah. And um, so I was a bit reluctant. But then uh, the editors knew uh, or the publishers knew of uh, the children's books that I have been writing, and uh, and especially the first book, the birds in the bamboo tree, because uh, they were these birds came to my window and built a nest. So that was my experience, and I wrote about it. And of course, the more I think about it, I know that I have always been a close observer. And I take great pleasure being in among trees and among um, gardens. And um, so I, I, I haven't, uh, for instance, gone into, been brave enough to gone into jungles and into wetlands. And, uh, and, and I'm always, I was always afraid of snakes and crocodiles and what have you, you know? So I am in that way, an urban gardener, an urban citizen, and comfortable in controlled spaces. I'm afraid to confess. I'm ashamed to confess. Um, and um, that's where I am. So yeah, I was writing about my personal experiences and my joy in my contacts with birds and and one particular animal that I wrote about. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, how about Anne? How about yourself? Um, in writing this essay, I think there, there were several thoughts that were crystallized, but um, I, I have to thank the editors of this collection, Angelia and Esther, for first planting the thought in my head that I should write um, about my bird watching experience as well as my nature guiding experience at Sungai Bolo Wetland Reserve, where I was a volunteer guide for a number of years. Um, I came to bird watching quite late in life. It was at the encouragement of a colleague from one of my former workplaces. And I think this essay was an opportunity to make sense of something beyond just the act of bird watching and to put all these thoughts in some sort of order and like Constance Connie says um, we come to nature very differently we all have different starting points and one of the things that crystallized for me was um, the act of naming a bird does not come naturally even though the act of looking at a bird seems very spontaneous and birds are so showy and so beautiful and so obvious and as I was writing this essay I was struggling with the idea of what does it mean to name a bird? And bird watchers are notorious for this because as a field of study, ornithology, it's very well developed um, in terms of its taxonomy and classification. And bird watchers in the stereotype sort of popular imagination, they know all the names, they know everything. And so where does that leave the rest of us um, in this divide between those who know and those who don't? And when I wrote the essay, The Bird Without a Name was about that struggle to name when you feel ashamed of what you don't know, or you don't even have the language perhaps to put these names to what you see. And so, you know, how, how do we go about this and how do we navigate this? And the essay is an exploration as many of the essays in this particular uh, collection are. You have, you have a lovely passage in there about that. Ah. That's something you might want to share. Okay, I'll, I'll read a little from 
the bird without a name. So this is kind of at the start. It begins anywhere this other kind of knowing. Over the years, I've come to learn that not every bird needs to be named and that sharing the name of a bird could offend. Naming a bird, oh, that's a Sunda Pitney woodpecker, means drawing attention to the listener's ignorance. And the way an entire feathered tribe exists beyond sight and hearing, or rather conscious sight or hearing. Since a tropical island like Singapore is an ecological paradise with 417 avian species recorded to date. To name a bird is to insist that we look more closely at so much empty space and all this grass just breeding mosquitoes. To give a bird a name implies that we welcome the wild into our words and into language, that most human and humanly fallible of entities. But when we ourselves refuse to learn the names that will allow birds to sit in our lives, and after all, it is so much easier to say, uh, so many trees were cut down, also can plant some more. We're saying that we know enough to remain ignorant. We're saying that the human is all that matters, while we become less human for every bird that lacks a name. That's all I usually intend when I name a bird. I appreciate it's a lot, especially for someone for whom a relationship with nature takes the form of a landscape painting or a phone's lock screen easily swiped away. I don't judge my friends who hate nature with a capital N and then add a capital H for good measure. One of them is bravely and politically incorrect and will tell anyone how he deplores trees, mud and grass. And yet another warns everyone not to touch plants or walk barefoot on the beach because you may catch a disease. After all, we have mostly bought into the myth that equates Singapore the island with Singapore the city. The self-concept of the urban and hypermodern pushes green spaces and environmental concerns to the periphery, where they exist in a zero-sum competition with other forms of land usage. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Anne. That was a that's a um lovely passage, and I like the play between like you know the imagery of an island. We usually use that that word to kind of think about a place of nature, but you know we define Singapore. Singaporeans define ourselves as being a part of an island city, right? And so, how does that kind of shift the way we understand about our relationship with nature? You mentioned a little bit about how that mind frame uh, has caused nature to sort of exist in our periphery only like we don't really see it um and i think i feel that sometimes myself uh i feel like we only get to experience nature in like little pockets right um and not as a whole mm -hmm. and just like you say sometimes when you see a bird that's really beautiful it feels rare it, it feels like it's a rarity it's not something that should be part of our daily lives but on the other hand, if we look at historically, when we in the early days of building Singapore, we have been quite deliberate in ensuring greenery was sort of everywhere. Right? I, I read um, an article where a former commissioner of parks and recreation actually recalled MMD saying that he felt was important that greenery was not just where rich people stay. Um, and I kind of wanted to take that and uh, uh, discuss a little bit first today. Is, is nature really just in our periphery? Uh, is it around us but we don't see it uh, or is it that we've not made it accessible enough to everyone are there some norms and practices that sort of preclude people from experiencing nature themselves in their daily lives you know what do, what, what are some of your own personal experience around this I, I, I think of one when you talk about pockets of nature um, when I look around to my my estate, I don't see the pockets either, you know, although I can't complain. I mean, I live just opposite uh, Macritchie Reservoir. And uh, I also noticed that people go, I think that was one of the issues we raised, people go and use these parks for exercises, but uh, are they aware of the nature around them? I mean, are they aware that they were, they are part of this ecosystem or they're just there to do exercise? 
Um, so to engage with nature, how do you engage with nature? I think Anne raises that, or you raised that, you know, how do you engage with nature? How do you do that? No, I, Anne, I was Anne as a nature guide, as a volunteer was, yeah. guide. So I might, has, the, has a different, has another perspective. Think right? yeah. I think whether we are jogging in Nekrichi or Botanic Gardens or visiting, there we, we go as exercise addicts. But when they come to you, you're a tourist. Exactly. What kind of engagement do you have, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm, and um, how did we I, get to that point? I think one of the things, I mean, there are a couple of things in the background here, and one is how we continue to see nature in a kind of use value relationships to ourselves. So if we go to the pockets to exercise, or if we go, uh, and the other assumption that's in the background here is that there's a, there is a kind of binary divide between the urban and the natural. So if you want to see nature, you go to a nature park and you view it like a tourist and you come back into the urban. And then again, you are in your situation where, oh, there's no nature here because I've visited nature and I've come back from mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And this binary, this norm actually conditions how perhaps we may not notice as much of nature in the urban space as, as we like to. And um, I think as a, as a nature guide, when I, when I take, the visitors or the guests um, on to the walks or of course show them how to see what there is in the wetlands but at the same time I try to make sense for my visitors of where we are in Singapore as a stopping over point that you can see birds anywhere that migratory birds pass through and they drop into little pockets of green simply by noticing uh, where you are how rich this island is you start to get a sense of the location we're in and the natural history that's ours to claim. And somehow we forget, we're, we're interested in human history, but we're not interested so much in natural history that's creeping into all these corners around us. But you know, um, it's since the, since it's become an artificial way of uh, inter integrating with nature or mm -hmm relating with nature. If you go back hundreds of years ago, even hundred years ago, nature was part of your life, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you grow your own food. And uh, I remember my mother used to take great joy in, she used to grow her own tapioca and her own uh, um, sugar cane and vegetables and all that. There was there was this, you feel it, yeah. you touch it. Um, and by feeling it and touching it, now I'm becoming very dreamy about this integration. You are passing some kind of energy between you and, <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether rationalists will accept that, but uh -huh. yeah. And, I, I had a, a silly thought and along those say lines. That it is it's healthy for you. You know, that kind of relationship with nature, which we can't have and we don't have because of the situation we are in. And unfairly so as well, because we, we have to do so much work to restore that relationship. But the, the silly thought that I alluded to was, I mean, there is definitely this residual longing to be with nature, to grow your own food. And unfortunately, not everyone can do that. But I'm wondering if, if people paid attention to the food on their plates, they might see that there is a relationship in the sense that if I look at a leaf on a plant, on a living plant, and then I look at the Kang Kong leaf that I eat, there are similarities. It is miraculous how this leaf has grown and is now on your plate. Um, you know, our mothers would say, don't play with your food, right? But I'm sure we've all looked at the fish on the plate and said, oh, you know, it's got eyes, it's got scales. I think that curiosity and that wonderment of the living matter that we are and that we interact with should be encouraged, even though it seems rude to play, play with your food. But 
I agree with you, Connie. There is a kind of divide in the sense that when we buy our food, when everything is transacted through money, it removes that immediate relationship, um, that more organic relationship that we still yearn for with something that's living and something that is green. Yeah, one of the things that I remember I mentioned it earlier, one of the things that I noticed when I read your essay and then I was looking at my, my essays all got to do with how uh, nature and things natural, you know, whether birds and what have you, serves my needs, you know? Uh, whereas I get the impression that you are talking about nature for its own sake, uh, its importance for its own sake, it's uh, it's a difficult thing. I, yeah, I yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. Because obviously we we still talk about it from our human intention to um decenter ourselves, right? Which is a contradiction in itself. Mm -hmm. Um I I'm quite a strong believer in 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 observing nature, not not simply to study it, but to to experience it. And um I I have the sense that sometimes we don't see because not just because we don't know it's there, but we don't have the language in which to describe it or we don't have any community with which to talk about it together or there's no one who has walked with us and shown us how to, to see it. Um, and I think, Connie, you, your essay, you spoke about your neighbor who you did not actually talk to for a number of years till the, you grew a garden and suddenly the garden or your twin gardens became a space to talk about things and so it's in an odd way, even though we, I, I think nature should not serve human users, but yet I think in a strange way, when a human community is rich, it embraces nature and it allows it to grow side by side. The more extreme viewpoints would say, oh, humans are blight upon this earth and we should reduce our population. But I somehow feel that that's rather ungenerous. It gets the wrong way around somehow. So it feels like there's this dual relationship, right? Like a, a nature space can create space for humans to come together, humans to uh, realize some joy, uh, some peace maybe. But um, what Anne you're saying is there is, there, is, there is also that opportunity then that as humans come together in this space that they start to form a different relationship with nature. Um, I wanted to explore a little bit of like the different spaces that we can create um, around us where these communities can come, whether I think Connie, you mentioned a little bit in your in your essay about community gardens, right? And just now you talked about that that innate relationship when you start growing food, when you start um, having that. But then there's also that corridor space outside your home. Like, and we know that a lot of people who live in HDBs are also, also want to bring that nature next to them in their corridors. Um, what do you think, it, what do you think we, sh we can do to kind of build a lasting connection with nature? Is it, is it more of these spaces near us? Um, is it, um, Maybe as Anne was sharing about naming birds, is it learning more about the species? Like, what, what do you think is necessary? Um, you know, uh, you, you talked earlier about community building and how nature um, serves a purpose. So I look at again, and sorry, it's always serving a purpose, um, either to the individual or to the community, but one, I mean, because I think we have to go back to our original relationship with nature, which was more authentic. Um, and uh, which was part of our lives, you know? So even we who are very much urbanized and live in an urban jungle, we can still relate to nature. We can still find a connection because we have that centuries old connection to nature, which we have lost along the way of urbanization and so on. But there is that innate, it's there in our system. So that is uh, something, something that we can 
make the connection with the human being. I, I see it as, uh, as a connection. I mean, there's nature, there is us, and we can come together through our experience of nature. That's how I experience with my own garden in my own block, you know, that um, because you're sharing something, you're sharing an interest. Again, I'm saying nature is serving our purpose. Um, so, yeah, that's how, I don't know how, what else to say, how else to go on. I have to you say, know? though, that I think when you talk about this innate response to nature, to say children seem to possess it more strongly than adults. At least I've observed this on my um, guiding tours. Sometimes they will point out things that, and they're able to, maybe because their lenses are not yet so conditioned and you know, mm -hmm. so burdened with worries. It's like, oh, what's that? Oh, why is it like this? And so on and so forth. And I think uh, if we can kind of push the point further, I'd like to say that um, to build community, we first need a language to talk about what it is that we're, we're trying to build together. Mm. And um, more than just naming the kinds of plants, the kinds of birds, it's also about naming the plants and birds that exist in this place called Singapore. And unfortunately, many children, um, I know it is in the primary school syllabus, some, some basic terms, parts of a plant, um, but most of the time, children don't really have a, too much of a vocabulary for the wonderful and rich flora and fauna we see around us. And it would be lovely if the way we teach language to our children, if you know, if parents could also teach being eco-literate or nature literate as, as one of the languages that they speak. So they when they, you know, learning a language is not just about knowing individual words, it's about being able to string a sentence together. So if I recognize the shape of the heart-shaped leaf of a sea hibiscus, I would say, oh, it's not. It's similar to a real hibiscus plant, but not quite the same. And so in a way, I'm like making a sentence across my different experiences. And I, I mean, I, I, I would like to say that it's as essential as being bilingual. If you're bilingual, truly bilingual, not just to take an exam. I'm not a good example in this, but truly bilingual in the sense I'm not just passing an exam. It means that you walk in these cultural worlds, that you're part of these cultural worlds where you can converse can interact, you understand the histories of things. And so to teach eco-literacy to a child and to say that you should be multilingual in that sense uh, means allowing them to unlock this whole world to make sense of it, to talk about it, to notice and to walk anywhere and to say, I can make a sentence, I can make a paragraph, I can say more about this to a friend or around me and notice it as well. It might be too romantic for a Saturday afternoon, but I wanted to say that. <laughs> Saturday afternoons are pretty much suitable for romantic notions. <laughs> okay. Despite the humidity, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I think that's really lovely. The idea that we need to become multilingual, right? The um that we need to be able to talk about the, the trees as as they are. And I, I think I experienced this myself too when I went to do my master's um in environmental management, no less. One of the classes we had to do was to walk through the forest. This was this was not in Singapore. Walk through the forest and uh, collect geospatial data on the trees. And for the life of me, like I, I can't recognize the trees. And there was no way for me, even though I was given very uh, simple uh, indicators, like oh look at the bark, you know, look at the shape of the leaves. But I found myself for two hours really trying to figure out is this what the bark description was given to me or mm -hmm. is this the shape of the leaf that was described to me and I and it was it was terrible and we I don't think we have that in our education system in Singapore to kind of or not even in the system like playtime right the playtime of children which is to understand nature I think that could be very interesting um so I think we talked a little bit about role of education already how about maybe do you feel like there are some mind frames in Singapore that prevent us? Um, as you said, I think, Connie, you mentioned there is, for you yourself, um, there is some fear with 
some of the uncontrolled nature, right? There's still some, some fear with that and uh, whether or not that is something very ingrained with us or the idea that, you know, we have so little land, um, you know, there's always a tension between what we can save and what we have for um, the rest of our, us going about our daily lives. Uh, what do you feel about some of these mind frames and mindsets that we might need to start reconsidering um, if yeah. we were to build that relationship? I think recently, I mean, there was, was it recently, two years ago, there were um, um, the chicken, poultry, uh, uh, hens, and uh, wandering around Bishan area, I think. And the cock crowing offended some sensibilities of, uh, of people, and they complained about it. And they wanted it, wanted the, the family of uh, the cock and the hen removed from the estate, cult probably, but other people protested. And so they're still wandering around the Bishan area. And if you go to the Bishan park, you see them, you know? For me, it has made a difference to see these natural, um, birds being allowed to run freely, you know, walk freely. It just makes, uh, makes our urbanized environment less rigid, less artificial. And uh, more live, more natural, more human. Well, not exactly human, but makes us more human. I think, you know, I was also interested, I think in your notes, somewhere I read just now that the government had promised to the big meeting, environmental meeting, that yes. they would stop deforestation in 2013. And yes. I was thinking by then they would have deforested the whole of the island. Anyway, there wouldn't be much left after 2030. So that was not a big huge promise, you know. <laughs> so there are some there was some in that space of like uh deforestation um and, and a lot of it for the purpose of building new homes. I think there was a there were a lot of campaigns this year, right? Dover Forest, Clementi Forest, um Kranji and um, I think with the Dover Forest, there was a little, there was a little bit of a change in mind. So one third of that space was going to be um, saved uh, or retained as a forest. Um, I don't know whether you feel that despite the uh, not 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 so uh, game changing pledge of twenty thirty that we might have made some headway in. Is it a demonstration of our community's love of nature increasing? You feel? Is it a, what's the question? Is it a is it an indication that there is increasing love um, from the community for nature? Because well, I think this, this time we saw a lot of people coming together, whether it was videographers or people like that. Or yeah, kind of, it, it's yeah. a global issue. It's a global issue, and um, so people have become more more aware more because of that, not because of single, Singapore's attempt or Ministry of Education's attempt to, to teach our children about nature. It's most, mostly because young people are more aware and more open to what's happening in the rest of the world and um, that we can contribute, you know, a change in attitude. And so we have more young people, I think, interested in raising issues that affect our env environment. But one of the things that, that uh, we haven't paid much attention to and is that it is becoming hotter, not just because of what's happening in the atmosphere, but because we have far more buildings now and the buildings are so close to each other. And uh, that what the trees do is to 
cool down the environment, you know? So there is that, if you, can, if you talk about even the government becoming more aware and promising to, uh, to contribute to, to easing the pressures on the environment, it doesn't come down. You know, my, my complaint about the trees being cut down every year, um, and why are the trees there? They cool the environment. And we have these buildings so close to each other and they're getting more and more, our environment is getting heated up. We're switching on the air conditioning to cool ourselves down, you know? <laughs> and we cut down the trees, which, which will contribute to cooling us down. So there is that contradiction, you know? It's not connected. Right. It's not connected. There's still some yeah, actions I, that kind of, yeah, kind of go, you know, go against that, mm, that trend. Mm, mm, mm. You know, and we, what talk you? About, we talk about one thing and when then we do something that, uh, that works against the ideal, you know? So, yeah, so I don't know where that- We have work to do. <laughs> Sorry? We have work to do. That's yeah, oh, yes, a lot do. of people yeah. have work to do. Yes. I, I wanted to go back to Singing's question about the mind frames that um, that that kind of shape our approach to nature and the urban. And um, I mean, I agree with Connie. There seems to be this weird irony in the sense that th there is a lot of rhetoric about how we should be green, that we should be a city in nature, but mm. somehow it doesn't filter down to the daily actions of um whether we preserve trees, whether, whether there's real thought that goes into landscaping and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the mind frames mm -hmm. is that we still think we can build our way out of this um, climate and environmental muddle that we're in. Uh, you know, we're still very much in that modernizing sort of mindset where, you know, in the past, if you have floods, you build bigger drains, you build bigger longkangs. Yeah. Um, and we, I think we've come to the point where we realize that, well, Singapore is going to flood and it's beyond, beyond our control. We can stop it getting into our homes. Um, and that there's a bigger issue at hand here, which is learning to live with the natural in our midst. And it somehow still doesn't quite translate down into the daily actions that seem that maybe the tree is more important than the temporary complaint that the birds are noisy in the trees. So there's still quite a bit of work to be done there. But as to whether there's increased love among Singaporeans for, for nature, I, I think love is a complicated word. And I think um, I think there's definitely a lot more awareness. There's a lot more reactiveness to, to natural or, or nature-related issues. Because if you look at Dover Forest, and actually before Dover Forest, there was a, um, this other small scandal wasn't small, it was quite big. Um, it, was, it, it came out on Chinese New Year Day where someone took a photo of some clearing of secondary forests near the Green Corridor at the Crunchy area. And I'm bringing these two examples up to say that it's actually the increased visibility of nature on social media that has made people aware that there is nature in our assumedly entirely urban environment. Um, and so people from whatever starting point that they're taking view is a it's a loss if we let more destruction go on but I think we have to go beyond this reactiveness to this like and sharing on Facebook and this outrage on on, on social media to maybe looking into ourselves and to saying you know what about the tree in front of my window you know mm -hmm. what about the next complaint I'm going to make about mosquitoes breathing or the coel that you know wakes me up every morning uh, these are the, which, you know, really, if there's a love for nature, love means embracing the other, however different that, that other being of person or being is, right? Then you really have to look at yourself and how you should reorientate yourself to this thing that you say you love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have um, a romantic theme going on today. I think. <laughs> I think I no, yeah, it, it carries on. And I think it, no, but I think it's really important. This, uh, we always say that love means you love everything of a, of of the other party, right? Whether it's good or whether it's bad, or whether it annoys us. And I think the manifestation of 
Singaporeans love for nature still sometimes stops at I only love it as as as, as long as it's okay for me. Um, the mon- I I want to I want to live close as to the I don't want the monkeys to come and steal my food. As long <laughs> yeah, I like to be angry about all on my car. <laughs> There's all the three leaves don't fall yeah. on my car. Yeah. Um. So we did have some questions, but I wanted before we wanted to move on. I think there's one uh, section in 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 Connie's uh, essay that I think kind of really sums up like why we have this conflict between why why we shouldn't have this conflict between um, us humans and nature. And I thought we can close the uh, discussion today and then move to Q and A with that. Okay, thank you, Osinye. Uh, well. It's from my essay, and if you have uh, your book, uh, if you have the book, it's on page 161. It is a sunny morning. I open my window and a bulbul darts away at the sound of the window opening. I look beyond and am delighted by a splendid yellow hibiscus blooming. The flowers, the birds, and the occasional butterflies offer bursts of delight, bursts of delight on ordinary days. My little garden is a source of joy that keeps on giving. My distraction this past week has been watching the second brood of bulbul chicks being raised. The parent bulbuls seem to have had a busy few months. They were here not so long ago in April, raising their first brood, one of which had died. It fell to me to bury it. Not a very happy experience for me. Now, as I watch these couple of new chicks, it reinforces my observation that one chick is always more demanding and stronger than the other. That dominant one has already started to test its wings, exercising it, stretching itself, and reaching out to feed, mostly by standing on top of its sibling. The nest is too small to accommodate the simultaneous activities of them both. That, this explains the broken wing of one of the April brood. But in all human life as well, it seems to me, we get stronger to be dominant at the cost of another's well-being. We stand on others to be where we are, heaved up at the expense of another. It is never fair but the winners pay a price too. We cannot dominate, devalue, or diminish another life without affecting our home, without it affecting our own humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that last line um, sort of leads to this comment that was just made on Facebook just now, whether or not we've been conditioned or educated to scrub out um, all the traces of our biophilia for ourselves. And maybe only now that we are rediscovering that we're a part of nature, that we can't diminish it without harming ourselves as well. Um, that's, I think that's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of glad that that point was being brought up by one of our listeners. But I want to go to the questions um, on Slido as well. Um, given, given this book, um, it's, full time, it's Eco-Feminist Essays from Singapore. One of the questions um, that we had um, that was also upvoted was whether as authors, um, how might you define ecofeminism yourself? And what do you think is the role it plays in Singapore? <laughs> that was the most difficult part of this whole exercise of writing this essay. And I wanted to know what does ecofeminism mean, you know? And uh, I remember discussing it with, uh, with uh, few of the other writers. What do, you, what do you mean? I've never heard of ecofeminist. But uh, I think it's got to do with the value system 
um, Anne will probably be better at explaining it than I am. And I'm, okay, I, I have the I'm OS has been out of the discussion. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, 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 I read, I, I, I tried to understand the concept of ecofeminism in relation to gender. This is dangerous territory. Yeah. Um, and the way I understood it or tried to make sense of it for myself is that not gender in an essentializing sort of approach where this is what woman is like or a feminine approach is like. Um, I understood it from the perspective of care in the sense yeah. that you can have male teachers and male nurses as well, but the role of care remains the same in these vocations. Um, and uh, at least for my own essay, looking with care at a bird or sharing the experience of naming a bird with care means in the same way that, you know, all good teaching is like you, you give that person the gift of sight, the gift of a name, the gift of being able to do something more than you previously could um, and not in the sense of dictating to the other person that, oh, okay, look, this is the bird and this is the correct way of doing it. It's an enabling sort of act. So I, for me, that's how I understood the, the feminine aspect, if you like, uh, the idea that the care, the, 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 equ the equitable sort of sharing of roles um, is important to this approach to encouraging looking at uh, encouraging more observation of nature. So it's not a hierarchy of nature knowing that there's the way the scientists do it and there's the way the laymen do it. Uh, no, the way you participate is to kind of walk alongside each other. Not that scientific knowledge is irrelevant and, and uh, it is an important system of knowledge, but I think it's also the kind of um, hierarchical attitudes we bring to some forms of knowledge some forms of languages being better than others that um, is disabling and paralyzing for some people who are trying to get started. You see, Anne has done it very well. Oh, thank you, thank Anne. You. <laughs> <laughs> so remove that hierarchy, um, re-explore that relationship with um, ourselves and the earth, and especially from a lens of care, right? What, 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 we, what we can do to care for the earth. Yeah. Okay. Another question, um, another question, and this one I think um, uh, is from Melissa. <laughs> I think Con Connie, just now you had already gave a little bit of your views of that target of halting deforestation by 2030. And I think yeah. um, Melissa was wondering between Anne and myself, uh, are we optimistic? about Singapore achieving such a target and whether or not we think that um, discussions uh, like today, like this one, can help us um, get there. Would you like to go first, Singin? Just passing the baton. <laughs> I feel as a moderator, <laughs> sorry, that, that wasn't, but I, I think in a way I agree with Connie, right? 2030 is nine years away and so um, I think what's more important than what gets done between now and 2030 and what is it that, what reframing can we do to re-understand why we might need to carry on uh, taking away the forests that are already on this land. Um, and discussions like today, I think it's, it's, it's interesting and different because we're trying to help people understand why uh, nature matters to them um, and many different avenues, whether it's through literature, whether it's through art, whether it's um, through uh, going, actually going to a, a natural space and spending time in it, breathing in the, the air. And I think that we need to start mobilizing all different ways of helping people understand why nat nature matters to us. So that's, that's, that's my take on it. I, in response to the 2030 targets, I... I feel I don't have a good understanding of what the definition of a forest is in, <laughs> in Singapore. Um, because, I mean, obviously we have our designated nature, nature reserves and of course we still have large tracts of land that are greened up um, and whether or not they are, you know, to the, to the biologists and um, what sort of habitats are these. So I don't, I feel that, I mean, I don't know enough to really have a strong view on how optimistic or pessimistic to be because I feel that we, we don't have a fine-tuned sense of 
what is it that we're trying to protect to what degree and we've not had even a detailed discussion on that. So definitely discussions like today are helpful in the sense that it reaffirms that this is important to a growing group of people and that it's okay to say, no, I think we need to make some noise about this or I don't feel this is right or maybe um, the priorities of development need to go hand in hand with some of these other priorities as well. Um, I don't think an all or nothing approach is helpful, which is why I'm not sure what deforestation means. It goes back to my, my beginning conundrum. Um, any of the debates about deforestation in, in bigger countries with bigger land masses, with forested land masses, are kind of magnified in a small place like us where the needs, concerns rub up like the tectonic plates of the earth even more sharply than, than anywhere else. So I, I can't say exactly whether I'll be optimistic or not. I feel that we don't even know enough to get a grasp of the situation, which is very reactive, I think, at this point. Great, thank, well, thank you. I, I think there's a little, there's, there's a, how do we even define forests in, in the way that we, we see it here in Singapore? I think that's a very fundamental question. Uh, I think that's something that really needs to be explored as we try to understand what this means to, um, to us as a pledge. Um, but there's also a little bit, we, we, we have two more questions on Slido and uh, one more on Facebook. Um, there's this part about education. There's a question about education about how, what is the role of the parent and what is, how do we enhance educating children about nature, especially in the homes? I think this was uh, for Anne, but I think that if Connie has comments or thoughts as well, it would be great to share. Um, so thank you to, to whoever who asked that question. I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate that you see education as beginning in the home because as a former teacher, the education system gets blamed for everything, everything. Um, and it's usually beyond the individual teacher's control because it's a system, right? Um, but as to what parents can do in a home, I think maybe it, parents themselves might like to explore together with their child, take them out to a natural place, but also, as I said earlier, learn the language of nature, learn how to identify the various things that you observe and which bring joy to you. Maybe you want to start with plants, maybe you like birds, maybe you like butterflies or insects. Some people like creepy crawlies, nothing wrong with that. And maybe also to be led by your child if your child is interested in a particular type or place in nature, go with them. I, I know okay, my parents are an example. I start, they started bird watching because of me, even though I was well into adult age at that point. But I, I have friends who start bird watching because their children um, are so keen on it and they accompany them. So if learning to see side by side and together, I think is a big part of that educational process. Um, Again, we seem to have this uh, mindset that the parent should be teaching the child, but I think it's an odd thing in nature where the, the parent becomes a child again and you, you're kind of like playing side by side. And I think that should be enjoyed. That should be, um, should be, should be taken as the, the start of it all. I would just say that nature is not another source of tuition. I'm just being satirical here, but um, don't please don't pack your children off to a nature workshop as if it is another tuition class. That's not how, you know, have fun, go for tuition with your kid, you know, in that sense, go out into the natural world and, and it'll be better that way, I think. I think Connie might have other ideas too. No, I, I think know. maybe we should move on to the next question. Okay. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, this is the, that's one question that I want to leave for the last, but this, so this other one is whether or not we feel, maybe the terminology that we, the common use of this term mother nature is part of the, you know, comes becomes part of the reason why we use the terminology the eco feminism. Um, is is using mother nature as a term um, kind of uh, restrictive in how we think about who and how we should care for nature? I was thinking of the the mother nature thingy. And I also, I think I, I use that um, 
the story in my essay, uh, and again to connect me to ecofeminism, is that women benefit women because they are mothers and housewives, and they are very high, highly dependent on on nature, natural forests, for instance. I'm talking about agri agrarian cultures. And uh, there was there's a story of this. Um, this was it's quite famous, actually. I can't quite remember the name of it, but logging companies logging forests, and these women tied themselves in the trees because they didn't want the forest to be, and they succeeded because it's the forests that provide food and kindling for fire and so on, which are essential necessities for a poor woman and the families, you know? So that way, yes, uh, I can see that women are, women are na nurturers of nature and um, they want to preserve nature. Um, I don't know where this mother nature thing came, maybe because of their nurturing qualities and mother nature feeds us. And a particular example in, in India of these women tying themselves in trees is an example of how, how mother nature, you require mother nature just to survive. You know? Um, so maybe that's where mother nature, that's yeah, right. it's a whole globe. It, uh, it embraces us, you know? Yeah. Mother Nature, yeah, it's not patriarchal. They cut down trees. <laughs> <laughs> they cut down trees. <laughs> <laughs> it's really yeah. interesting to think of uh, Mother Earth as the, I mean, as you say, the all-embracing, holistic yeah. understanding of the Earth, which is outside of um, more human-centered endeavors, whether they're patriarchal or otherwise. I was also thinking of how mothers can be quite yes as well. So um, it's a way in which Mother Nature, with the recent natural disasters, is is telling you something. She's warning you that not manage, you know, we've not stewarded this earth of ours very well, and so we might need to be told off a little bit before we get it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The different the different facades of um, of um, of uh, parenting. <laughs> oh, that's that's for sure. I don't know if Mother Nature is a tiger mother, but okay, too many metaphors. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> well, um, so the last the last question um, that I wanted to kind of given that this is a this is a this is a session to kind of introduce and really discuss some of the very interesting and um, mixed and diverse themes that come out from uh, making kin as a book. Um, there's a question here of whether or not any other essays in, in Making Kin um, resonated with you um, and whether or not, uh, and why? Well, I haven't had time to read all of them, but I remember reading Metilda's. You remember that? Metilda Gabriel Pillay's. She was talking about home and she was very passionate about home and um, why we cling on to homes, you know? Uh, I, 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 I've been thinking about that. And I was thinking that in Singapore, over the last 50 years, there have been so many dramatic changes that the one stable place you can hold on to if you, are, if you own a freehold, <laughs> even then you can't rely on it. But that's one stable, uh, one source of stability in your life. You know, it's your home. So I thought I I found that essay. No, I haven't had time to read the other essays. Yeah, well, I think honest. I have read other essays. There was one essay about the field. Yeah, yeah, I remember the field. <laughs> yes, but I can't remember 
the but the home the one essay about home because she sounded so passionate and i have changed homes a lot and uh, i was thinking it's it's something we can hold on to you know the the home because yeah. that's one thing we have control over that there are, the the theme of home was very uh, was quite common in a number of different essays for sure and I think mm -hmm. the, def the different definitions of how somebody feels like a place is their home was also something that was very much explored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how about yes. you? How about yourself? Interestingly, um, I mean, to be honest, I've not read all the essays as well, bit in and out. Um, but the one that stuck in my mind um, also deals with the theme of home, and it's uh, Angela's Poon Traveling in Place. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. For some reason, the it was... It was her portrayal, or I mean, her her recording of the lived physical experience of walking through Katong and how the body has a memory. So she talks about how yes. yeah, yeah. when you walk along the five foot ways, there's always this extra high step that you have to be careful, yes. otherwise you yes. trip or yes. you fall, or maybe someone has warned you that it's, it's dangerous. And very, when you, very when problematic you for old people like me. Oh dear. <laughs> Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I do think the articulation of these things is important. Uh, you know, the, the the getting around the experience of getting around. Um. I mean, she also talks about how Katong used to be the seafront, and of course, it was reclaimed. Mm. Mm. Um. And how I think her essay is really about what we remember and the memories we inherit, which are not our own memories, but we rediscover in the place. Um, so it's like all these traces that we trace and retrace um, and somehow they have a power over us. Um, so I found that I'm still kind of chewing over it. I'm not sure entirely what to make of it, but it stayed with me. Yeah, um, I, 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 I feel that sentiment about chewing over the essays. Actually, quite a number of the essays, I feel as if um, the first time I read them, number one, I felt like there was such brave... Uh, uh, articulation of like personal history and then to then let them sit and kind of um, try to understand the different facets of how this person essay is bringing up different themes in life um, that I myself should really think about you know like uh, how do I define my home um, mm. you know relationship with um, parents who are getting elderly mm. and um, also where do we find our own histories, right? Where do we find our own like familiar or uh, urban histories? And just now, I think Anne mentioned we, we, we like we, we in Singapore we we when we talk about our heritage and our histories, so much of it is you know buildings. It's very very um, concrete type things that are uh, urban, and yet we don't really talk about the natural histories of our space that we have here. Mm. Um, so thank you very much, both of you, today for this hour uh, of contemplating and um, romantic notions, as um, Anne mentioned, as we talk about, you know, the innate. It is innate in us to have this authentic relationship with nature, but there are so many different things that we might need to um, work on to move from just being aware, just being reactive, to really just internalizing or uh, embracing nature so that we actually do demonstrate our love in a way that um, is equivalent to uh, what nature has given us. Right? Um, so I think this has been a very lovely way to spend my afternoon. I hope that the listeners feel the same way. And I apologize to some of the questions that came a little bit later that we might not have been able to address. <laughs>